I'm going to kind of condense this message a little bit because I think we can get it fairly quickly today. Uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I, I spoke on a, on a topic that's kind of similar to this where I was going through different parts of the scriptures that have been manipulated over time to kind of write out the stories of women. And there's a lot of instances where uh, women played important roles, and some of them mothers played important roles. Um, there's a lot of instances where women played important roles, and they're oftentimes diminished or just simply taken out or replaced or labeled in a way that's negative, uh, where the, the woman in the story is always a harlot or the woman in the story is always... That, that would be the word that they would use in the scriptures. Um, or the woman was, you know, untrustworthy, or the woman was a deceiver like Eve. We have a lot of negative stereotypes of women in the scriptures that frankly, if I can say this, frankly are, are not true, obviously, but also really kind of sick when you watch the history of time uh, and the way that the scriptures were translated. Uh, the truth is, is that when the King James was translated, it was all men. And the majority of translations, especially the ones that we look at as, as standards, they were, uh, it was very male-dominated patriarchal societies that translated these, these scriptures. And so I thought, today, why not take us back to the beginning? So if you're watching this online or you go to listen to it later, uh, we, we're on Apple Podcasts, all the stuff, so you guys, if you don't get enough of my voice, you can just... Put yourself to sleep. Just make sure you're not driving and uh, listen to the podcast. But we have, um, we have. This is called Mother's Day, of course. But um, this is um, from the beginning. So if we go back to Genesis one and start to look at some of the Hebrew words and the original language versus the way that they were either translated or replaced, you're going to maybe begin to see a little bit of an agenda here. Okay, but. Through this, other than just pointing out what I believe are some inaccuracies, through this we're also going to understand the massively important role of mothers, maternal figures, in this world from the beginning of time. So let's look, if we can, at Genesis 1. If you don't know where Genesis 1 is, just turn page by page. You're going to find it quicker than you think. Start at the beginning. That's a Bible joke. Okay, so in, got that for Veggie Tales. Um, that was a weird show. Can we just point that out for a moment? <laughs> I've had more nightmares about those vegetables. You love Veggie Tales? It makes sense. It makes sense. That's all I'm saying. After the way you sang that song yesterday, that was like rebellious Veggie Tales on steroids. That's what that was over there. After Jose got done singing yesterday, he's saying, Teddy swims, lose control. I said, you need to repent. You just need to go find somewhere to repent. It was that good. Um, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew, the word God here is just the word L, lowercase e, lowercase L. And it is a generic Semitic term for God. It is not the God. It is not a specific a named God at this point. It's just this divine being uh, at this point, unnamed, not described yet. So this L, E-L, when we translate it into English, we've already got the capital G here, right? We're already, we, we, we know who we're talking about. But in this original Hebrew text, it would have just been this lowercase e. And it says, and the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness. Now, if you look at this, um, this word that we translate in some of your scriptures as void is actually a term that is used to describe um, what a, the conditions of a womb would be like. Like a mother's womb. And in some instances, scholars directly translate this word to the word um, 
rechem, R-E-C-H-E-M, which is the word womb, which we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll hit on later. So in the beginning, God, lowercase e, created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Let me just kind of go through this for a second. So in the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, was God. We have the big G. That's not, not what I meant. In, but in Hebrew, it's just L, no capital. And L, the generic Semitic word, is for God. In the beginning, L created the heavens and the earth. Just like, imagine just a God. Now the earth was a formless void. The word void here is this word called tohu wabohu, which I, I, I don't do Hebrew well. But it's a squishy, if you can imagine this, damp cavern reminiscent of a womb. The earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep. This word deep or dark waters is to home. Then L, lowercase e, lowercase L, spirit hovered over the water. Spirit here is the word ruach, which some of you may have heard before. So the spirit of God in this womb-like atmosphere is the word ruach. That is, um, that's hovering over this, the, these waters. Ruach is the feminine word for breath. This is going to make sense, I promise you. I'm going to bring this all together. So let's kind of build this for a second. So we've got this formless void like a womb. An empty womb, if you will. Then we have this feminine breath, the Ruach of God that begins to speak over the waters. Let's keep going down. So God's feminine breath hovered over this womb, if you will. When suddenly God speaks and there's light and the waters, are you ready for this? The word for the waters beginning to divide actually is the word broken. So the waters broke. Now, Let's set this up. In the beginning was a womb. The womb had this feminine breath, also known as the spirit, ruach, breathed over it, breath in and out. And the waters began to break and the earth began to take form. Life began to come from the womb. Now this process took five days from this point forward. So I want you to picture a woman breathing in labor for five days as she births new life. Now this is not Pastor Dan stretching it. Go look at these words, the original Hebrew words. This is basically the only honest conclusion I think you can come from. The picture God gives us of the creation of life is that of a mother's womb and the feminine labored breath of somebody going through the process of birthing. Well, it's not how it reads, is it? It's amazing because there are absolutely plenty of references to God in a, a non-feminine, a male uh, reference. There's lots of masculine references to God. It's not that there's no masculine references, there are. But when they are a masculine reference, we oftentimes see God referred to as the pronoun of he or him. When they are words that are feminine, we do not see the word she, we see the word the, as in the spirit of God. If we talk about Father God, it's in the masculine sense, Father. If we talk about the spirit of God, it's the spirit. We don't say mother spirit, but yet that word, that term is feminine. Now, the conclusion ultimately, and I'm going to get to that is that there is no gender in God. Did you know that? 
There's no male or female, June or Greek. Come on, there's no God. We like to put things in this very like finite understanding of what we, there's no gender in God. God is not male or female. God is not biologically one or the other. God supersedes the idea of um, gender. And, and very interesting enough, um, now this is going to just freak some people out, and that's okay. Um, no, what is he going to do? When it comes to describing like this idea or concept of God not being something that is like definable when it comes to gender, or it comes to race, when it comes to all the things that we separate people with, um, I'll say this quietly. I think the Hindus do it better than we do. I know. Do you know what the Hindus say about God? Let me read this to you. The Hindus say this. The Hindu literature that we find describes God as this, beyond the beyond and beyond that also. Now we have some scriptures in the Bible that are very similar to that idea, but it's like God is beyond your and my, mine and your beyond. So think of the furthest that we can bring our mind to understanding the width and breadth of the idea, the person of God, and it's beyond that and also beyond that beyond also. Confused yet? So trying to define it in, in these terms, so it's very silly that we somehow have, have brought these gender terms to God, but if we're going to gender God with Father God, because that word when it's translated Father God in the scriptures is indeed a masculine, either Hebrew or Greek term, then we need to be honest when we have feminine terms of also capturing the other side of the, the two polarizing gender spectrums here. I mean, if we're being honest. So we have the word Ruach, feminine. We have, um, as we go down in chapter... Um, go beyond that. Then as we go down a little bit further in this, in this reference, you're going to see that then it says in the image of God. So in the image of God, it says God created them in the Hebrew. Then we know we fill in it's Adam and Eve. It says God created them. Now the way that we oftentimes read this and, and, and if it happened this way, and, and probably did, is that Adam was created first, and then we like the idea of then woman being created from Adam. But God says, I created both of them. Do you, do you see the subtle difference there? Right? It's like, you know, ladies, you're welcome. All it took to us to create you guys is just one rip. I got more. You sweet little. She's cute, but she's not that smart, you know. Right? Just took a rip. That's all. No, God says, listen. Yeah, I get that idea that God created man and then from man took this rib, created woman. But God says, I created them in my image. I didn't create man and then created woman in the image of man. I created them in my image. In other words, I put 100% of my uh, creative power into both of them. One is not inferior to the other. One is not a byproduct of the other. One wasn't down the line in this creative process. I created both of them. And so um, if we go to chapter 2 of Genesis, beyond that, in verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living person. If you read this, you're going to find out that here we, we see it translated that then Lord God, Lord being a masculine term, so when this is translated in the King James, this is where we first see Lord God, right? But the term here is actually Elohim, which is 
a feminine word for majesty. Or for some of you in the room, fabulous. <laughs> this is a feminine word. It is a majestic picture, uh, you know, a, like a beautiful adorned gown, regal and royal. It's a majestic feminine term that we translate Lord God. Now, gentlemen in the room, let me speak to you for a moment. We might read this and go, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that when we have a several thousand year history of making sure that women feel less than in the church. When I grew up, the, the messaging that I heard from the pulpit is that women are not less than, women are just different. They have a different role. And that was the way we played it. And, and although I think that biologically women can do some things that men can't and vice versa, um, and our reproductive organs are different, and there's lots of other parts of that, that it's very easy to, when you hear, oh, one's not better than the other. This is what we used to say from the pulpit. One's not better than the other. It's just we have different roles. But the problem is, is when we have messaging coming from the evangelical world, like the Southern Baptist Convention, who's the largest denomination, evangelical denomination in the world, um, saying very clearly that not only can you not have a pastoral position as a female, but you can't speak. And if you, as a male ordained pastor in that conference or in that ordination or um, denomination, if you go to a conference where there is a female speaking at that conference, you could lose your ordination for even speaking at a conference that has a woman speaking. And this is the largest, most ev influential evangelical denomination in the world. So when you're a guy, it's easy to be like, well, you know, we're just different. No, no, that's not the message at the end of the day. The message at the end of the day is that women are inferior, that women are second place to men, that they were created second, that they were created from men, and without men, they wouldn't have been created. And that God can somehow only speak through to a crowd of people or an audience, a man which is ridiculous and also explains why, and I'm going to show you some more examples, that we have edited out the femininity of these scriptures, but made sure that everyone that had a masculine term was very clear that it is a masculine term being used. So you're a conspiracy theorist, Pastor Dan. No, look it up for yourself. There's no conspiracy here. Now, let me show you this. You ready for this? We first finally get the first name for God in, I think, uh, chapter 17 of Genesis, where the Lord is talking um, Elohim. Remember that feminine majestic term, Elohim, enters into a covenant with Abraham, right? And the first time we see a name for God is in chapter 17 of Genesis. Finally, we get a name for this thing. First it's El, and then we just say Elohim, and then we finally get a name. And it's not just L, El, because El's just simply the God, or a God. It's very generic. Now we have a name to it. And the name for God that we first see in chapter 17 is El Shaddai. How many of you have ever heard that before? Most of you. El Shaddai. Finally, we have a name for God in verse 17. Well, I've got some bad news. El Shaddai translates as God with breasts. Or the breasted one. Don't be mad at me. I didn't write this. I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I just listened to them. Look it up. What does El Shaddai mean in Hebrew? The breasted one. Now... <laughs> Well, good thing those translators chose not to translate that one. They just translated God Almighty. They didn't translate it, and God the breasted one spoke with Abraham. 
It was the Lord God Almighty. So over and over and over again in the, in the Old Testament, we also see the word that um, I was referencing earlier, Rechem, R-E-C-H-E-M. That word gets translated to mercy. When you see mercy in uh, the Old Testament, it usually is the word, um, well, it's the original word, Rechem. But Rechem does not mean mercy. God's love is described with the word Rechem. Now, the Rechem comes from the word Rachem, which is the same word with an A, R-A-C-H-E-M. And Rachem means mercy, but Rechem does not. Rechem means womb. Now, I do believe that mercy, the idea of mercy, is intertwined with the idea of a womb, but it is not the same word, right? Women don't say, you know, I birthed you from my mercy, young man, right? It's a different word. The English translated word here is rachem or rachem. I'm going to spit on somebody if I keep doing that. I have enough Jewish friends that if they watch that be like, really, you were saying rechem up there, Dan? You were saying rechem? You could have just done a quick Google search on how to say this in Hebrew. Um, but rechem means womb. So when we see that God's love defined as mercy, we're actually reading that God's love is a womb-like love, this safe place for people to get ready to, to grow to have the sustenance and the necessary um, ingredients to, to grow and create and to be birthed out. That's what the love of God is described like. So think about this for a moment. The creation comes from this thing that is symbolized in the Hebrew as a womb. The first creative force, ladies, listen to me. The first creative force that we see is the spirit of God hovering over the waters is the feminine word for breath. Then the waters break and birthed from this, this creative force, this, this, this divine spirit, this divine feminine spirit from this uniquely divine feminine place creative place is the world, creation. And then the first time we see God, God is the breasted one. Now, if you grew up in church, did you get any of this? Why? Oh, wait. What are we so afraid of? well, then the women are going to start talking back. I got news for you, dude. She talks back in her head. She, she says it all in here. Doesn't mean it's not happening. Well, you know, somebody has to lead. I don't know. I watched my sister as she has quadrupled Harvest House in the last 10 years and become one of the most respected leaders in the nonprofit world and, and is loved and adored by the who's who of Sarasota's philanthropic um, uh, people out there. She's been to hell and back individually, spiritually, um, with her family, and she's led and built something that was incredible. She's an incredible leader, one of the best I know. People love working for her, love being on her team, um, you know, and she really didn't need me. She did it all on her own. Isn't that just something? It's almost like you ladies are equal and sometimes I feel like us men would be just better off just being like, tell us what to do. That's all I'm gonna say. And listen, on Father's Day, we'll hit that hard and tell all the, all the, all the dads and hear how wonderful and great you are and thanks for playing catch with your kid one time and all that stuff. 
we'll do that. But there's nothing like a mother's love or, or, or a person who is, 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 is fulfilling that role because we have people from all sorts of family dynamics here that don't look exactly like the traditional family. And if you are being that comfort and that support and that safe place and all of the ways that we see and describe the, the maternal instincts of God, um, that, that, that covering place, that place to, to gather and to, and to console and to grieve with and all of that, if you're playing that role in the life of people around you or children around you in any capacity, then this day's for you too. And you need to hear what the scriptures are saying about how that operates in your life and the way it blesses the world. So needless to say, at Harvest, I can tell you one thing. We are not only have great respect and reverence for that feminine energy and that, that female um, creative power to birth something and to create something. We don't only have great reverence for it. We're kind of scared of it too, in a good way. Gentlemen, I'm going to say this to you. I'm not sucking up because my wife's not in here and she doesn't listen to my sermons. And my mom and my sister are away this week. We celebrated Mother's Day with them last week. Um, we have missed out in the church. This is very funny. We, um, as we have become affirming of the LGBTQ community, we have seen like, you know, part of our affirmation of the LGBTQ community has put people on the stage that wouldn't be here without it. And we have this like these hidden gems of talent like Jamie here who gets up there and she's one of the best guitar players in Sarasota. I guarantee you she wouldn't be up there if we didn't love the way we loved. She doesn't have time for it. She's a New York girl and she'll just tell you to go to hell so fast you won't even have to spin. And that's putting it nicely, all right? It's probably going to be something else. And sometimes she says it out loud on the microphone and then we got to talk later about it. No, we never talk. I love it. But I'm going to tell you right now, like... That wouldn't be here. We actually have, the church has missed out on all of the gifts and all of the great, beautiful talents and all of the beautiful things that the LGBTQ community has had to offer us, like Debbie on the drums. And so many more, right? We've missed out. I'm going to tell you this, the same goes for women. The church has missed out on what women can bring to the table because we have had our heads up our rear ends for too long listening to the patriarchal nonsense that actually isn't the word of God. Do you hear me? It's not the word of God. There is just as much, if not more, feminine nouns and pronouns used in, in the creative power of God in the scriptures as there is masculine ones, but we don't see it. A couple times, literally a couple times, I refer, I have referred in service to God in a female pronoun. And people leave the church over it. What is wrong? What does that say? What does that say to the women in your life that you can't imagine that anything godly could be feminine? Think about that. What are we communicating? I have two daughters. What am I communicating to them? Listen, if a, if a woman ruled Russia right now, I don't think they'd be attacking Ukraine. If a, if a woman ran the United States, we probably would spend less money on, on bombs and more money on books. But that's just my opinion. That's my opinion. That's the way I feel about it. So we have Elohim, which is the feminine word for majesty. El Shaddai, which means the breasted one. Rechem, Rechem, which means womb love, motherly love. And then we see that it's like, okay, well, that's the Hebrew, Pastor Dan. But you know that Ruach, the spirit of God, the feminine breath of God, that labored breathing that creates life in the birthing process, that created life when it, when it hovered over and spoke over the waters in the beginning of time. That word is then also used, or the word spirit in the Greek right? Completely different language. The Greeks got it right. Wasn't the Greeks fault. They got it right because their word for spirit is pneumani, pneuma, which is also, I hate to say it, a feminine noun for breath. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be over? Mm. 
next thing you know, Pastor Dan, she's going to want to see how much money is in our bank account, too. Mm -hmm. I know, I know, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. If that works for you, that's fine, but you know what I'm talking about. Check this out, though. By the time the church gets around to translating the Bible into Latin, before you know it, the Holy Spirit becomes a he. It's a she in the Hebrew. It's a she in the Greek. We get to the Latin, which is a translation right before it becomes English. It's he. Masculine terms. Why? The, the Jews understood the feminine nature of these words. The Greeks understood it. Why? I don't have time to go into all of that. But as we continue down, and I'm, I'm going to probably stop here because I, I want to, we'll, we'll wrap up things so that y'all can. Uh, as we continue down, we see that wisdom in Proverbs, every time the word wisdom is used in Proverbs, which is a lot, it's a feminine term. It's a feminine characteristic of God. We see it in the Greek. When wisdom is used, it's a feminine term. And so much of the different, yeah, did you want to say something? Oh, I thought you were flagging me down. So much of the, so much of the ways that we describe God and the names we use for God in the Greek and Hebrew are feminine terms. Now, if we can get to a point where we take gender out of the idea of God, that would probably be the most accurate way that we could move forward in describing God. But I'll say this, if we can at least get to a point where we see God, although not accurate, I will say, just as much of the feminine energy as the masculine energy, that would be a heck of a lot closer to at least what literature could hold when this was originally written in the Hebrew. Because it's very clear. I have only twice in my life ever heard a male pastor reference the word El Shaddai as the breasted one. Twice in my life. I've been in church almost my entire life. Why? Well, talk about wonderful counselor, defender, mighty God, Lord God, all these things. Why not? Why not? The, I mean, there's the law of first when you study the scriptures is important. You'd think that the first name for God would be a big deal. But when we get to this, it's funny because I've sung songs about El Shaddai, but I've never sung a song that said the breasted one. I think there's that one Lizzo tune that has that in there, but that's different. <laughs> never. We get to that, it's like all of a sudden we become Hebrew scholars. We're like, let's just stick with El Shaddai on this one. It works better with the lyrics. Does it? So what I want to say to you, the moms and mom figures in this place today, is that we have a long way to go in the church. And your gift, whether it be in the traditional sense of mothering or in some other way, like Aaron described, but not limited to in the video, I want to tell you that your voice and the creative power that lives in you is really important to the work of God going forward. I know for, for many of you who come from marginalized communities like the LGBT community, it is not uncommon for the mom, a mother, to be the first one to understand. And that's not always the case. It was in my family. And for many families, it's the mother that's the first one to say, hey, you're still my child. Because mothers inherently have this desire. And when a mother doesn't act in this way, which many of you have experienced, they're going against their very nature and design. Because mothers are inherently designed to love and include, to gather, to not separate, to not push away, to not reject. For those of you that have experienced the rejection, this is one of the things I've learned. Oftentimes when somebody has issues with their father, we say, go to God. But when they have issues with their mother that have caused trauma in their life, we don't usually send them back to God because we don't see 
the beautiful healing power of the feminine heart are characteristic of who God is. But the same spirit that spoke over the waters, the same spirit that I believe breathed life into Christ, that raised Christ from the dead, dwells within you. And it is the spirit of creative power, the, the, the power that labors and delivers and brings forth life. It's in you. And we need it. But if you've experienced the opposite with your mother, if you've experienced something that didn't look like love, didn't look like being included and valued, didn't look like somebody that gathered and, 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 and spoke hope and wisdom and all of the things that we, we walk around needing, I believe you can also go to God to heal some of those wounds. And for you ladies that are in the building today that say, well, I haven't biologically birthed a child. There are so many other people in Sarasota and even in this room right now who are waiting for a mother figure in their life to look them in the eyes and just simply say something like, I'm proud of you. Or you're important, or you're valuable, or I see you. Uh, it's time for a revolution of those mothers and mother figures to stand up and realize the church, which is people, needs you. Don't be limited to the traditions of what it looks like to be a mother. We need that motherly instinct that we see from the very creation of, of the world. We need it more than ever in this generation for people to feel safe, for people to feel like they can grow, that they're protected, that something around them is making sure they're okay. Make sense? Will you stand up with me? That was a good message, Pastor Dan. You did great. You want to freak your friends out? Just tell them you're, um, tell them you woke up this morning and prayed to the breasted one. And they'll say, what? I just say, El Shaddai. Duh. You must be Baptist. You don't know that? I'm just kidding. Uh, Lord, today as we um, just celebrate what always seems to be a very complex and complicated holiday for so many um, who have different experiences with the idea of a mom. Um, and words are never enough to cover all of it. But as we leave here today, um, some of us, this is a, a complicated day. Some of, for some of us, it's a, not a great day at all. And for some of us, it's just a day of joy. And there's room and space for all of that. But God, I'm asking that the Ruach of God, the feminine breath, the Rechem, the womb-like love of God, be our portion today, that we would feel that and experience it and know that it's available for us. And so today we also, we kind of position our hearts to repent for all how oftentimes we have missed out because those feminine voices in our life and in the church have been silenced or diminished at the very best. We repent because we, we know that we're missing out on so much of who and what God is by allowing it to be just this male-dominated idea. So, Father, we just ask that you continue to help us to see both parts of it and everything in between, <laughs> to realize that you are beyond the beyond and even beyond that. Thank you, Father, for this today, for recalibrating our hearts, setting us in a place where we can receive the fullness of who you are and extend that to the world around us that all would know how much they're loved and safe and seen and valued and protected. In Jesus' name, and everyone says? Amen. Amen. Y'all, I'm going to pop out there. If you would like your Mother's Day portrait, we, it, it happens in about, literally about 60 seconds, two minutes. So just meet me out in the lobby. 
and we'll get some photos. God bless you. Have a wonderful Mother's Day.